fate of you who are listening, of nations, of the world, has often hung upon accident or upon decisions that made the other way would have substantially altered the course of human events. Suppose by a stroke of fate the attempt to assassinate Archduke Ferdinand of Austria had failed. Would there have been a World War I? Suppose fate had decreed that Chamberlain refused to appease Hitler at Munich. Would there have been a World War II? Yes, much depends upon a stroke of fate. And tonight we rewrite history as we present a dramatic conception of what might have happened if, by a stroke of fate, Benedict Arnold's plot to betray America had succeeded. In 1780, Major General Benedict Arnold, in command of the vital post at West Point, conspired to turn over that post to the British. As you know, he actually failed. In tonight's story, by a stroke of fate, he succeeds. Our story is only historically true up to our stroke of fate, a decision that tonight makes Arnold's treason successful. Perhaps you'll recognize that fateful decision. It will be explained for you at the end of the program. If Arnold's treachery had succeeded in its aim, this is how it might have come about. Good evening. My name is John Andre. The monument above my bones in Westminster Abbey bears my name and rank and the date of my death. But I'm quite sure all of you now listening know me better as Major Andre, once called a spy. You may recall that I was adjutant to Lieutenant General Sir Henry Clinton at New York and negotiator for Sir Henry with one General Benedict Arnold in a matter of treason long ago. Let me tell you of my first meeting with General Arnold. Oh, we had exchanged many letters over many months in a devilishly complicated code. But it was not until late September of the year 1780 that His Majesty's small sloop of war, Vulture, carried me to a rendezvous in a cove near Haverstraw, and a rowboat ferried me in toward the west shore of the Hudson just after midnight. Mr. Moore. Mr. Moore, are you there? Mr. Robinson? Is that Robinson? No, this is Anderson. John Anderson. Good, come ashore. Here. The star but a little. This way, Anderson. Here, right here. If we might step back a bit among the fir trees. Certainly, Mr. Moore. I'm at your service. This sheltered place will serve. Now, Mr. Anderson, you're in fact Major John Andre? I am, Mr. Moore. And you, I fervently hope, are General Benedict Arnold. Oh, I'm weary of code words, general, and false names. So am I. And with your permission, I shall begin with a portion of our matter most distasteful to both of us. The uh, money, General? Yes, the money. I hope that you understand, and General Clinton, too. I hope you realize that I'd ask for no reward at all in this adventure were it not for my wife and my children. I must protect them in the event of... In the event of uh, failure, General? We will not fail. We cannot. West Point will be yours within a week. Now, let me be blunt, Major. I've asked for a guarantee of 10,000 pounds, win or lose. Will General Clinton provide that sum? I shall be equally forthright. General Clinton is prepared to supply you with... 6,000 pounds. Hmm? In the event of success, then his original offer of 20,000 for the fortress and 3,000 prisoners will stand good. Nonsense. Ridiculous nonsense. It's wretched enough that I'm to deliver the strongest military post in the Americas on a basis of commercial contingency. Are we to bicker here like tradesmen over the terms? Are we to pair cheese when a continent's at stake? Major Andre, we've nothing further to discuss. Good evening to you. <laughs> But discuss we did. Talk, 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 all the rest of the night. Sitting there under the dark fir trees, our backs against two stumps. I promised him I would use my considerable influence with General Clinton to meet his demand. Though uneasy, he agreed to go on with the plan. He had moved too far, with his wife urging him on, I think, to turn back. 
We arranged a multitude of details through that longest night in my memory, and I prepared to leave. Wait. There's uh, one further matter in addition to the papers I mentioned. General Washington will be returning from his meeting with the French in five days. I suggest that your attack be timed so that at least a uh, possibility may exist of capturing the general as well as the fortress. If that could be done... It's a remote possibility, no more. However, it is a possibility. Uh, suppose the general were to be delayed somehow on his return just across the river and just at the right time. A squadron of cavalry landed above the ferry point just before the main attack on the west shore begins. By heaven, sir! If you can arrange such a capture... There'll be no difficulty concerning rewards. Britain's wide world would be yours to drink from a golden cup. Yes, so I thought. Well, and now, Major Andre, uh, if we can adjourn to Mr. Smith's house up the road, the papers I spoke of will be provided. But, General Arnold, I must return to the vulture. What? Look there, above the trees, it's almost dawn. I have ventured beyond my instructions in landing at all on rebel-held ground. But the papers are important, man. They contain information concerning the numbers of our troops and their disposition. I have that information in my head, General. Really, I beg of you. I, I must get back to Captain Sutherland aboard ship. If the vulture should be attacked at sunrise by a shore battery... Very well, then. We shall meet, I trust, on the ramparts of West Point. As brothers in arms. My hand upon it. I must leave you, General Arnold. Au revoir. Until the attack. Until then, sir. Good luck. The voice had whispered in my brain at the cock's crow. Get back to the vulture, John Andre, for your life. Get back to that boat. And when I climbed over the side a few minutes later, I had reason to be thankful that I had heeded that strange voice. Miss Andre, oh, thank heavens you're back. All hands aloft, make sail. Uh, Up anchor. Uh, What's wrong, Captain uh, Sutherland? Look yonder, on the opposite shore. Rebel artillery and the vulture in range of their battery. Let us by all means get out of range, Captain, and quickly. Keep open fire. Short. By the splash, ten yards short. But close enough. Let's get out of here. Mr. Hawkins, make haste. Aye, sir. Over us that time, but not by much. We're bracketed. Now those are six-pound shot. They'd go through our hull if they hit us. Ah, shot again. They're poor shots. We're drawing away, Captain. I believe we're drawing away. Look at the sail. We have a fair breeze. A few more yards will do it, Major. We've made it, Captain. We're beyond reach of the, of the shore. Let them bang away. <laughs> Major Andre... If you had delayed five minutes longer... Something told me to leave Arnold when the cock crowed. I might have been stranded, marooned with all of Westchester between me and General Clinton. Perhaps I'd have been captured. Who knows? I might have been hanged as a spy. <laughs> what an appalling thought. Mm, fate's been kind to you, Major. You're a lucky man. Oh, she's an old friend of mine, Lady Luck. I caught her with laughter and rhyme. And now, sir, I discover that I am perishing of a thirst, having talked with the traitor all the night. Do you suppose... Uh, certainly, Major. Let's go below. I have some excellent rebel rum. Good. We'll drink to... to Lady Luck. I had known the lovely, young, ambitious Peggy Shippen in Philadelphia before she married Arnold. I was to know her through many troubled years. Peggy Shippen Arnold has often told me what happened when the general returned to West Point after that exhausting conference downriver. Who's there? It's Ben. Ben. Oh, Ben. Oh, Peggy. I'm so tired. My cursed leg. Lie down over here on the bed. Here, let me help you. There. Ben? Yes, Peggy? Is it... Is it done? It's done. I talked with Andre himself. And the... The money? It's arranged as we'd agreed together. You and I. We can go to London, then. When the war is won, when the British win. Peggy, 
When the war is over, I'll buy you London town, house by house. Lady Arnold, eh? <sighs> Duchess of West Point, eh? Oh, Ben. Now I'm tired. Oh, confounded leg. I wish I'd let them saw it off at Albany. When I think of Saratoga, the torture I suffered and the way they refused me honor, refused me advancement, badgered me with vile slanders, even Washington, though I loved him once. Uh, I've ridden too far today. Too far. Ben, you're not sorry. Not now. I think sometimes of Washington. Peggy... Is he the better man? Of course not. Not a better man than you. I feel... I'll tell you, Peggy. I, I feel as I once felt as a boy back in Connecticut. I was the leader of all the lads round about. Of course you were, my love. But I was never satisfied, never. I had to go on proving myself the most daring young devil of the lot. We had a swimming hole at the Norwich Mill Dam, it was, with a mill wheel turning... That lout, Will Henry, dared me to ride the mill wheel around as it turned. I took the dare. I had to do it. Ten times around, I rode that wheel, round and round, underwater half the time, with my skull never more than half an inch from the rocks of the mill race on each upturn of the wheel. <laughs> then I dove out and swam underwater to the shore. I popped up and I thumbed my nose at all the rest of them, and then I went home high as a kite and walking on air. We'll reach home, then. <laughs> high as a kite and we'll walk on air. The world will belong to us. The great world, the gay world. We'll have them all at our feet. London, Paris, Vienna. Yes, yes, we'll win out. But I'm in the mill race again right now. And the rocks are terribly close to my brain. And I'm too tired. Too tired. Go to sleep, Ben, dear. And dream of glory. Glory. Glory and honor. Glory and honor. I've always loved honor. You are listening to what might have happened if, by a stroke of fate, Benedict Arnold's conspiracy to betray America had succeeded. Our story was historically true only up to the stroke of fate. A decision that might have changed history. From then on and during the next act, historical possibility guides our imagination. Five days later, we British moved on West Point at dawn. With three ships of the line and 4,000 infantry ferried upstream in row galleys, General Clinton commanding. In darkness, just before sunrise... A troop of cavalry with a secret purpose landed just below Cold Spring on the east shore. Our success at the point was perfect, almost incredible, thanks to my sweetheart, Lady Luck. In the headquarters room at West Point, when the fort was ours, and our Union Jack rose above it... Welcome to West Point, General Clinton. We have a pleasant view from these ramparts, have we not? Most pleasant, and you have made us more than welcome, sir. This day's work has preserved an empire... Alive and whole. The business across the river at the landing, how's it gone? With Washington. We have no word as yet. All has been confusion. I have asked Major Andre to inquire. If you've caught Washington, I wish to receive his surrender. Personally. Here. In this room. Why? It is my pleasure. Do you hate the man, sir? No, he's the best of the lot. But he kept me waiting, waiting, waiting for justice after the Saratoga battle. I could wish now to... To humble him, General? I think that is hardly possible. Surely it needs thought you... Had no sleep now for days. Your Excellency, General, sir. Yes, Major Andre. We've done it. It's worked. General Washington, Colonel Hamilton, and the General Staff have been taken across the river half an hour ago. Splendid, splendid. All of them, John? All save Lafayette. The Frenchman's mouth went lame, and he stopped at Fishkill a few miles north. <laughs> he was lucky. But there's time yet. If we could send a company of horse up river. Give the necessary orders, Major. Yes, sir. Well, General Arnold. Our success is quite complete. Did you hear me, General? I'm out of the wheel. The mill race is run. The rocks are gone. I'm in safe water. 
I beg your pardon, General. I, I, I didn't quite understand. Oh, uh, nothing, nothing. I am weary, General. Ask Major Andre to bring General Washington here. I'm not ashamed of what I've done. I wish to face him. But, General Arnold, uh, this is most unusual and, and much too precipitate. It's unheard of. Ask Major Andre to bring General Washington here. I've given you West Point. Give me the general. I must face him. I need to face him. General Clinton, I am Colonel Alexander Hamilton. May I present General Washington? Good evening, General Clinton. We were bound to meet, eventually. Fate, sir, has decided that our meeting should be an unhappy one for you. As one soldier to another, accept my regrets. I rejoice, of course, at the good fortune of my own cause. Had it been otherwise... Had it been otherwise, you may be sure that all the usual ancient courtesies would have been extended. However, had I won by suborning treason, as I might have done had it seemed necessary, I should have spared you the presence of the traitor-in-chief when we met. General Washington... Silence, you treacherous dog! General Clinton... I must demand that you remove this creature, Arnold, from our presence. And we are to talk as honorable men and soldiers. General Arnold, sir, has earned my gratitude. But surely not your esteem. Throw the dirty scoundrel out. Colonel Hamilton, may I remind you that you're my prisoner? Did someone speak? Gentlemen, gentlemen, we have much to consider quietly. General Washington, I am obliged by my position and my duty to tell you this. If you will consent to send word to your continental troops in the Jersey Mountains to disband and return to their homes, you will be treated with the utmost leniency during your uh, your visit with us in New York. And on the completion of a treaty of peace, you will be released without condition. If you refuse to do as we ask, you'll be transported to London at the earliest opportunity. There to stand trial for rebellion against the Crown. I believe I can anticipate your decision? You can. I have been a rebel in your point of view for five years. I think I shall die a rebel. And I have a certain curiosity concerning the Tower of London. I believe, sir, the terms are for General you, Clinton, must we talk with a vileness in the room? General Arnold, I wonder... Hamilton, if... if you would care to meet me in the courtyard below at once, sir. At once. With pistols, sir. The field of honor, Mr. Benedict Arnold. How could you expect that now or ever again? Sir Henry, I had your promise. You had no promise from me concerning this present event. I have promised you 20,000 pounds for West Point and 3,000 Yankees. You have earned it, and you shall have it. You shall have also, as far as I am able to control opinion, the respect of the officers in the army I lead. And you shall have command in that army, in the field or not, as you wish. Well, this is a bargain, Dave. Why, you young fool! Stop I... him, Andre! Arnold, I must ask you to leave us now. You are in no physical condition to continue further. We shall need to talk here quietly and long and late. Uh, forgive me, Arnold. It is best for all of us. Very well, then. I think on the field of battle, Arnold was the most courageous man I ever knew. But his strength was beyond his own control, at the mercy of a fearful pride. He was a Lucifer in regimentals. And I, since I felt responsible for his fate, well, I found myself more and more his friend in the later days. And Peggy Arnold's friend as well. During the second winter after West Point, at Philadelphia, where Arnold governed a growling populace... John, John, Sir John, when will it end? Where will it end? The war, Peggy? Must we talk of war? I promised you I'd sketch your portrait again. Would you uh, pose for me now? A major general and still an artist. Oh, John, I'm sick to death of battles, too, but when will it end? Who knows? We've offered these curious people everything. Representation in Parliament, the repeal of all grievous trade restrictions their own Congress to continue as their continental government here, General Washington's freedom, everything. Everything except independence. Could we do that? 
when we've won the war. But have you won? Did you win at West Point? Does anyone ever win? It's almost over now. Your husband has seen to that. He's ravaged Connecticut. His own home. His own state. I saw him afterwards, John. He looked like... like death. They'll not forget him in Virginia along the James. Who shall ever forget Benedict Arnold on this side of the ocean? But, John, I'm a woman. I, I don't understand war or warriors. How can these rebels go on and on? They're strong men, Peggy. Nathaniel Green, Harry Knox, Sullivan, Morgan, George Rogers Clark, and Lafayette, who slipped through our fingers up on the Hudson, they won't surrender. Not Green or Lafayette or the others. They lurk behind the western mountains and strike when they can. Where the sea route runs, we rule. Inland, we chase a will-o'-the-wisp. It's what is called a, a guerrilla war now. In London, the king's ministers are sick to death of it. London. Once upon a time, it seemed so near. Gay city. It's not so far, dear lady. And not so gay. But may we not forget our troubles for a while? If you wish, I'll, uh, I'll play for you. <laughs> Please do, General Andre. <laughs> quiet now, quiet, Peggy. It's nothing, I'm sure. No, it's nothing. Just the same thing. The same thing. What was that noise? A stone, Ben. Another stone. There have been so many stones. Oh, there's a note, I suppose, tied to the stone as usual. Yes, Ben, here it is. <laughs> they have no imagination, these Dutch and Quaker scum. It reads, get out, traitor, get out of Philadelphia. <laughs> well, they shall have their wish. You have news from Clinton? Famous news, John. At last, they're taking my advice in New York. We're to move on the nest of rebels in the Virginia Hills with concerted force. I'm to lead, John, with you and Cornwallis as my division commanders. But I'm to lead. This time, we'll chase them clear into the Ohio. Near Stanton, in the valley of the Shenandoah, at a mountain pass... The last organized American army, commanded by Nathaniel Green, surprised the British under Arnold. We British were destroyed, wiped out in one hot, furious afternoon. But Arnold lived, with a ball in his chest and another in his tortured thigh. The leg that had been hit at Quebec and crushed at Saratoga. And I lived, too untouched by lead, for Lady Luck is my sweet, dear friend. I tended him through the terrors of a hospital wagon train over the corduroy roads, and I got him home at last to Philadelphia, a desperately wounded prisoner under guard in his own house where he lay for many weeks. John. John. Why are the bells ringing? Peggy, tell them to stop those bells. Why are they ringing? Then you, you must be quiet. The, the doctor said... I've never been quiet. Why are the bells ringing? Ben, I'm afraid it's bad news. The war is over. We've given in to independence. The people are celebrating. The people. Louts. Fool scum. Oh, ben. Oh, Ben. Oh, Peggy. Peggy. I'm afraid you'll never be a duchess now. I don't care, Ben. What do I care? How can I care? Peggy, I think you'd better leave now. It would be better. Oh, no, John. Please, let me stay. I'll be good. I'll be strong. So strong. Ben. Can you hear me, Ben? Yes. Yes, I, I can hear you, John. I... I led you on under the fir trees by the Hudson. I wouldn't give up my own quest for glory. Will you forgive me? Not, nothing to forgive. It, it's justice. But I... I always had to be top man. Always. <laughs> Peggy, 
What is it, Ben? What is it? The mill wheel. The wheel. It stopped. The wheel stopped turning. The wheel has stopped. Ladies and gentlemen, please recall, if you will, this scene in which a stroke of fate occurred that might have changed history and led to the success of Benedict Arnold's treachery. And now, Major Andre, if we can adjourn to Mr. Smith's house up the road, the papers I spoke of will be provided. But, General Arnold, I must return to the vulture. Hmm? Look there, above the trees, it's almost dawn. But the papers are important, man. They contain information concerning the numbers of our troops and their disposition. I have that information in my head, General. Really, I beg of you, I, I must get back to Captain Sutherland aboard ship. Goodbye, General Arnold. Here to explain what the actual stroke of fate was is our consultant on tonight's program, the noted historian, James Thomas Flexner, author of the best-selling biography of Arnold and Andre, The Traitor and the Spy, Mr. Flexner. The stroke of fate that changed history in tonight's show was Andre's decision to return to the Vulture instead of going to Smith's house. In reality, he went with Arnold, and while they were at Smith's, the vulture was fired on and slipped down river. The following night, Andre set out for British territory on horseback. He had almost reached safety when three armed farmers grabbed his horse's bridle. Finding under his stockings the papers he had gone to Smith's house to see, they realized that he was a spy and delivered him to an American outpost. Lady Luck so arranged it that Arnold received the news of Andre's capture before a messenger who was sent to General Washington reached him, and thus the conspirator escaped to British-held New York, where Peggy Arnold joined him. Andre was hanged as a spy, but he died so nobly he became an international hero. Living on, the Arnolds fled to England, where they sank ever deeper into debt and disgrace. At long last, Arnold succumbed to what Peggy called a perturbed mind, and she soon followed him to a grave so obscure that its location was forgotten. The heroism Arnold had displayed before his treason had made Washington and many other leading patriots his friends. However, their political opponents refrained from starting a witch hunt, and... When it became clear that the miscreant had acted almost completely alone, American faith in American unity mounted. The slender chance, the stroke of fate, by which Andre had been captured, was regarded by patriots as proof that God had intervened to protect a righteous cause. In the end, Arnold's unsuccessful treason strengthened the patriot march to victory. Thank you, Mr. Flexner. We invite you to listen next week to hear what might have happened if, by a stroke of fate, Julius Caesar had wed Egypt's queen, Cleopatra. Featured in tonight's Stroke of Fate presentation were Alexander Scorby as Benedict Arnold, Richard Waring as Major John Andre, others in the cast, Ted Osborne, Marie Stroud, Wendell Holmes, Frederick Rolfe, and William Redfield. Your announcer is Lionel Rico. Stroke of Fate is produced by Martin Lester Lewis, conceived by Mort Lewis, and directed by Fred Way. Tonight's play was written by George Faulkner. This is the NBC Radio Network.